Hi, everybody. Um, good to see you. This is Liz Barry. Um, welcoming everybody to the October 2015 Open Hour. And we are going to talk about DIY plant filtering remediation kits. And I'm really happy to have um, Nick Shapiro and Gretchen Gerke and Shreya. Subramani. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with us here. And also I see a few people joining in um, um, in the live call. Um, so uh, who I'm going to ask for an introduction just as soon as I introduce um, what we're going to talk about today. So um, <clears throat> this is regarding um, Public Lab's indoor air quality project. And there's a lot of different pieces of this that um, that our presenters are going to explain to us. But just to go over the overall structure um, of our time today, um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about the origins of the Where We Breathe project in post-Katrina FEMA trailers with really high formaldehyde off-gassing. We're going to hear um, a slightly geeky presentation of 1970s NASA research on what plants would best filter air in space stations. Um, we're going to bring these two topics together and talk about what a kind of contemporary plant filter um, looks like and then get into, you know, what, what elements, um, you know, what individual pieces you'd actually want to think about sourcing in order to make your own and join this sort of um, group experiment that's building here. Um, and then we'll see where the discussion goes. Well, um, I want to invite um, um, Bronwyn and then Lindsay to introduce yourselves. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, hi. I, um, I'm Bronwyn. I was working a little bit. Um, we were kind of getting started sort of thinking through some of the ideas for, um, you know, prototyping these things. Um, and, and yeah, I, I, I guess I sort of was recently a librarian, but now I work in a prototyping lab, so I've got lots of tools and fun stuff that I can sort of lend to the cause. I know that we're kind of going to look at, at things that are really easy to put together, but, um, you know, in sort of figuring out what those are, I can kind of lend resources to that. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Awesome. We can kind of hear okay. you, Lindsay. Can you fix your mic? Yeah, let me see what I've got here. Is that any better? Yeah, a little better. Okay, cool. Hi, I'm Lindsay Page. Uh, I'm with the New York City Mayor of Tech and Innovation. Um, and so I work on kind of sensing and technology and that kind of stuff. Uh, so I'm kind of just curious to learn more about what's going on with this project, just out of general interest. Okay, great. Um, I could hear that, but for some people it may have been muffled. Um, so. Yeah, if you want to also things. pick up the chat room and put your put your introduction in there, and then um, maybe check your microphone so that we can we can connect with you more as the call goes on. Sorry about that. Oh, no problem at all. Um, thank you. All right, great. Well, I'm going to hand it over to Nick. Um, Nick, are you good to go? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so hello, everyone. I'm Nick Shapiro. I'm a, an open air fellow at Public Lab, and also. Um, Matter, Materials, and Culture Fellow at the Chemical Heritage Foundation in Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm trained as a medical anthropologist, and I've been thinking about indoor air quality for more years than I, <laughs> I would like. Um, and I've been tracking indoor air quality issues for about six years now. Um, and this research um, really started in post-Katrina New Orleans and the, and the Gulf Coast in, in general. Lindsay, your, your intro popped up, so... See it now, um, and so as as a, many of you may know, um, following the displacement of over people as a result of Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, there the federal government decided to issue over 120,000 trailers, uh, emergency housing units, and these housing units had really really high formaldehyde levels. So these trailers, which then housed over 300,000 people. Um, amount to basically the most concentrated formaldehyde exposure in our species history. This is 
an arguable fact. Um, and we're, this is, we're beginning here as an inroads because the FEMA trailers, these really small manufactured homes, exemplify um, all of our homes. And it, it exemplifies the materials that we all cohabitate with, the way that we're all slightly being corroded by this chemical formaldehyde, um, and also can help us move forward in thinking through the ways that we can both quantify and then also remediate this problem. So beginning in the 1950s, American housing started having increased an increased amount of engineered woods. Um, so I'll just do a quick screen share of some slides. I have, a, I have like an archaic computer, so it'll take a second. No, um, we're seeing it. It looks good. Okay. So in the background, you see um, some engineered wood, and engineered wood is held together with formaldehyde. So from formaldehyde phenol resins are a really important bonding agent. And actually, a lot of these engineered wood companies market themselves as green because they're using wood that would otherwise be thrown out. Um, but formaldehyde is an irritant, uh, an allergen, uh, a, a neurotoxin and a known human carcinogen. Um, so this chemical has been infusing residential space in increasing quantities following World War II when there was all these returned servicemen re um, coming back to America and requiring cheap and very quickly built housing. So this chemical subsidizes our standard of living, enables the, the, the homeownership rates that we have in, in the country, but also has all these hidden problems. Um, and so as, as we start sealing the house tighter, in the 1970s there was an oil embargo, and so federal regulations on how much ventilation would be required decreased. So there's an there's a, a interesting uh, uh, trade-off between uh, air quality and, uh, and energy usage. So we sealed the, the houses tighter, and there was less... I'm sorry, feedback. Um, am I, I might be the only one hearing that. No, you're not. I got it. Okay. Cool. Sorry. Um, I'm just a little distracted. I should have plowed on. Um, and so these trailers are really small, these FEMA trailers, really small, 250 square feet. They're almost entirely engineered wood. There's very low ventilation. Um, and they sort of exemplify all these issues um, that cause bad air quality. Low air exchange, uh, engineered woods, and very little interior space to dilute that air, to dilute that toxin. Um, and so this was a huge, this is, you know, one of the ways that people, you know, you, you need an, event, an event in order to latch on to these ongoing chronic chemical problems, and this was the event. And as a result, they're, they're changing uh, the legislation, um, but it's it's really not going to be good enough because it's a, it's a regulation based upon what the industry can do, and it's not based upon uh, health factors. So it's sort of a, it's a huge problem. It's everywhere, um, and it's not necessarily killing people, but it's corroding them. It's causing hypercognition, slowing of thought, headaches. It's causing nightmares, which is a really strange um, thing that I found you know in, in two thirds of the people I talked to. Um, so it's really changing people's quality of life. It's changing people the way people smell, the way people taste. Sometimes it's just everything tastes like aluminum foil. Um, so it's these slow, ongoing, cruddy interactions that this is causing um, that are hard to sort of stir our liberal empathy. Um, so in trying to figure out um, my, like, Sputnik era, era computer is very slow. So I'm trying to figure out um, how yeah. to move forward on this. We don't research. have your screen share anymore, Nick. Do you want to screen okay. share again for us? That's Yeah, I'm in the process. There we are. Is that working? Super. Um, so what we did is we, we turned to a space that is the, the most closed, that has the least air exchange, and has the most synthetic materials, and that's not the trailers of an ongoing and other America that we largely forget, but that's the, the space stations and the future housing of the colonization of the cosmos uh, that are being built by NASA. So we turn to this um, the space station, uh, or this mock home called One Main Street Mars that you're seeing right now. So there's the exterior on the left and the interior on the right. 
And when scientists walked into this half-cylinder herald of the future's housing stock, they weren't greeted with this like refined airs of space-age living, uh, but they were met with a blast of volatile organic chemicals. And the scientists themselves, even after a matter of minutes, were developing um, irritations and respiratory problems. Um, so what they did to, do, to combat that um, was they installed a, a variety of uh, low-light needing common house plants. And so this guy on the top who's in this beautifully 1990s uh, vintage look where he's got a mullet and acid wash jeans, uh, he was a graduate student that was forced to spend a, a summer uh, living in this, uh, in this model home for the future. And he experienced no health problems and uh, mass, spectro mass spectroscopy uh, found very, very, very reduced levels of VOCs in the air after the installation of these houseplants. Um, so this is this is very exciting. This is during you know uh, Biosphere Two era and the most important cultural heritage of all time, uh, Polly Shore's uh, biodome. <laughs> uh, and so this is there's a, it's a very 90s moment. But this you know you've probably seen things like this percolating through your feeds. Uh, you know, grow indoor plants and improve your house, your air quality in your home. But this fellow on the right is um, a fellow in India who runs a tech firm and computers are constantly off-gassing formaldehyde, toluene, and other, uh, other uh, VOCs and endocrine disruptors. So he was very excited to um, not only combat, it, combat the, the, um, the city-wide air quality issues in New Delhi, but also the local indoor air quality issues of a tech firm by installing hundreds and hundreds of plants um, in his in his home or in his in his office rather, but you can kind of see the pro the problem is that these studies that NASA conducted were based upon chamber studies, so a very small amount of air and and then a plant inside of it. And so once you do a mass based equation, you realize that you're going to need over 650 plants for the average uh, American house uh, in order to to actively remediate the air quality. Um, so you can see that this is, it becomes an invasive species in your own house. Uh, the amount of, it's very costly. This is a very expensive to buy all the equipment and the plants. It's very water intensive. It requires a lot of labor. And it also, also at this many plants is probably going to increase the humidity levels to, um, to a level at which you might find other indoor air quality problems such as mold uh, and different viruses. Or, sorry, mold and fungus. Um, so... One of the things that we've been trying to do at, at Public Lab is we've been interested in first monitoring uh, how much formaldehyde is in the air. Um, and then when, in doing this, um, Matthew Lippincott and I were working on reversing the diaphragm of this pump. So the, the blue thing at the bottom of the screen is an aquarium pump. Um, and you can reverse the diaphragm and turn that into a vacuum. And so we were pulling that through a color metric detection tube to uh, analyze and quantify the amount of formaldehyde in the air. Um, but we also realized that you could pull air through the root system uh, of common house plants. Uh, this is Sansevieria, also known as mother-in-law's tongue on the left, in the center, spider plant, uh, and on the right, golden pathos. And so you can pull air through the rhizosphere and increase the, um, the amount of air going through the root system by uh, 200 times. And so what 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 science had, what sort of scientific studies since the 1990s have found out is that it's not actually the aerial portions of the plants. Sorry, I'm like gesticulating wildly, but you can't see me. Um, the it's it's not the above ground portion of the plants that are doing the remediating. It's really the below ground uh, rhizosphere. So it's the microenvironment uh, that is cultivated by the root autolysis and root exudates that are really cultivating bacteria that have the appetite for metabolizing formaldehyde. And so what's really amazing is that the more formaldehyde you pump into the into these bacteria, the larger their appetite gets. So it's not actually a metabolic limit. You can remediate even more and more formaldehyde. The more formaldehyde you get, the better your remediating quality is. And so that's the opposite of the, the sort of mechanical filters that are on the market today. So what the problem is, is the diffusion limitation. And so that's why we're using the pumps to circulate air through the roof system. So that we've got a variety of models here from plastic pots that cost 
thirty cents to a glass that I found at a thrift market, and then also a metal a metal pot that I found at a thrift market a thrift store. Um, and so that's some of the, the basic uh, ideas. Uh, Dan Beavers and I then went down to Picayune, Mississippi. So this Dennis Space Center, where that Space Center I showed you at the beginning, is in Picayune, Mississippi. And we went to an, uh, a, a FEMA trailer that's also in, Pic uh, in Picayune, Mississippi, uh, and it has incredible formaldehyde issues, a, a family that I've been working with for um, five years now, and I've measured their air quality several times over the years. And we we put in the this plant filter, and we found a 40% reduction in the formaldehyde levels in about a month's time. Um, so that's that's larger than we actually anticipated. Um, and so that's a that's a quick overview. Um, I can get into more details. I just get self-conscious after talking for 15 minutes. Um, Gretchen, do you have do you want to talk about the 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 monitoring device at all? Gretchen has been working on remediation extensively um, and done a lot of lab work uh, uh, on remediation. So like the, the nitty gritty of the chemistry is something that like, Gretchen's very familiar with. Uh, yeah. That, Nick, that was an awesome overview. Thank, thank you for that. Um, and also just highlighting the 1990s moment with Polly Shore's biodome. His good memories. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so the... Um, the the well first off the uh, the detection tubes are interesting they're just based on um, uh, there's a chemical a hydroxylamine chemical coating silica beads inside this tube and when you draw air through the tube um, any aldehyde that's in that air is going to react with that hydroxylamine and create this stain uh, it changes the color from an orange to a pink and so the way the tubes work is that you figure out how much air you've drawn through, um, and or, or actually it kind of tells you how much air to draw through. Um, and then based on the progression of the stain, it tells you um, the concentration of, of formaldehyde in the air. So we tested out um, how well these tubes work because uh, they're formaldehyde detection tubes uh, nominally, but that reaction that occurs within the tube doesn't actually only occur with formaldehyde. It can be with other ketones or aldehydes, which are other compounds that have similar functional groups or basically the reactive parts of molecules. And so the um, so other common or potentially common co-contaminants are things like acetone um, and then also acid aldehyde and maybe acetone nitrile, but that would be a fairly different reaction. Um, but so we we tested to see if the, um, basically how, how accurate these tubes are if you have other co-contaminants. Uh, so we went to uh, a couple of homes in, in Rhode Island and set up our pump next to um, a pump that uh, belongs to the Department of Health. And, um, and their analysis can, can quantify. They use, um, basically there's a, a reactive cartridge and you also draw air through that cartridge. Um, and then in basically you pumping through different solvents, uh, you, you can create um, derivatives. So you, you change the chemical compounds and then you stick those onto another column. And then when you elute that, um, it'll, you can quantify how much formaldehyde, how much acetaldehyde, and how much acetone you have. Um, and so the, it, our, our tubes did show, or the, the Kitagawa brand um, uh, formaldehyde tubes did, did show that there was a difference between the amount of formaldehyde um, uh, reported by those tubes and the amount of formaldehyde uh, reported by the DOH can uh, uh, cartridges. So um, we're trying to figure out exactly what, you know, how quantitative we can be using these low-cost uh, Kitagawa tubes. And based on 10 samples, there is a really good linear correlation um, between the formaldehyde concentrations of the DOH cartridges and the formaldehyde concentrations of the, those Kitagawa tubes that, that we're using. Um, but with a sample size of 10, um, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to say if that will be statistically significant. And so we need to expand that study um, to, 
just to um, in order to see like you know does that relationship hold up um, in under different circumstances. Um, but I, I was actually really surprised that there was such a good linear correlation. The um, the percent errors range from like 20 percent to 70 percent, but the ones with 70 percent were in a situation where there was like astronomically high acetone, so it's kind of unusual. But um, anyway, so that's kind of the progress we're making with that, and we're going to post a research right. note about that like today, tomorrow. Um, but as far as the remediation part goes, this is super exciting because even if we can't, like, you know, if our ability to quantify formaldehyde is, you know, we're, we're figuring out what exactly that, that um, what our capabilities are with that, it almost doesn't matter if we can quantify that, if we can qualitatively assess, you know, is it, ha has our formaldehyde concentration gone down over time? With the use of these plant filters, um, and that's you know exciting, kind of regardless. And the reason I'm really interested in, in remediation is, though we would love to not have a contaminated world, we do. And remediation, this kind of style of remediation, is something that we can do, even if we don't have, you know, progressive indoor air quality protection policies in place, or even if we don't have you know, kind of larger scale, um, uh, if, if, if we don't have the policies in place and the regulations in place to actually protect our air, like this is something small that we can do with this ongoing persistent problem um, while we work toward getting better regulations in place. Um, but as Nick said, the main problem is that all of these tests were done in chambers um, with like a piece of wood um, or some other off gassing material and in a plant in a small contained area. Whereas in a house, you're going to have consistent off-gassing from a lot of um, sources and from deeper sources. So that the, the time frame in which something off-gasses is going to be longer than with your single piece of wood. Um, and, and also is going to be modified by the, the temperature and the humidity change um, within the house. Um, and, and so we do need this kind of much broader experiment to find out how well these plants can work. And especially when we also don't know exactly what the co-contaminants are. Um, and these microbes are not necessarily, well, none of them are formaldehyde specific. Um, and so when you have a situation where you could have a variety of, of volatile organics, you know, these microbes are going to be uh, degrading a lot of those. And actually formaldehyde can be a um, a product of degradation of other chemicals. And so um, understanding how that whole cycle works uh, is something that we need to assess. So I'm pretty excited about this. I just wanted to add one, one, other, add thing one other thing about the, the air filter. The air filter. Um, um, it's, not, it's not an entirely it's novel, novel process. process. Oh, I'm, I'm getting yeah. feedback. Um, um, it's not entirely it's not novel. There, novel. there was a, a doc, uh, Dr. Bill Wolf uh, at NASA who uh, pioneered this technique at Stennis, at Stennis, who now sells plant air filters for, um, let's see, I think it's several hundred dollars. I'm just clicking through right now. It is $229. Um, so there's a, there's a somewhat similar, there's something out there already that has a, a similar principle that is, Two hundred, um, and it's not quite at the price point that uh, people who are living in manufactured housing, the people who are differentially exposed, uh, could really purchase it. Um, and there's other ideas. You know, it's not so. It's the bacteria in the rhizosphere, um, and it's specifically the gram-negative rod bacteria that seems to be the most hungry. Um, so there's possibilities we could even have like a bacterial broth, and just having a the the aquarium pump pump air through that, through that bacterial broth, and you could actually have a contagious uh, form of, like, a chain letter where you could send, a, like, a, a sourdough starter for air quality cleaning um, around. But, wow. Uh, Nick, think... let me just jump in because you just said contagious chain letter of bacterial broth, and um, I don't think that that phrase has ever, ever been uttered before. So I just wanted to, you know, shout Especially that out. Especially in a positive light. I, don't, I think people <laughs> might have said that in some sort of, yeah, make sure it look like anthrax. Hmm? 
Let's just make sure it doesn't look like anthrax. Yeah, but like it could be a, like a sourdough starter for cleaning your air. Um, so we are we are like familiar with sharing certain kinds of bacteria, while other ones maintain this stigma. Um, and so I mean that's sort of the, the basics. We're also um, going to be including some other passive forms of air filtering, like um, carbon or uh, biochar, or something that Gretchen has worked on specifically. So in putting that into the into the uh, growth medium. But I think Shana has done some of this hands-on work. I, I don't know if it's if you'd like to talk about that or if that's too early. Are you talking about me? Yeah. yeah. Shreya. Shreya. I'm Shreya. 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 I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Um, I actually haven't done much of this hands-on work. Um, I think Bronwyn, uh, Liz, and I have been, uh, we're just kind of, brainstorming. Um, I'm trained in anthropology as well. Hi, Nick. Um, <laughs> we're, uh, I actually met a colleague of yours, Evan, on Friday at my advisor's home, and we, he was like, you have to meet Nick Shapiro, so this is great. Um, so I think what we were talking about a lot was kind of the, the pragmatics of how a kit would be disseminated and how people would interact with the materialities of the kit. So how to buy a plant. Would you buy a plant? Would you include a plant? Would you buy this kind of container? Would you use this kind of container? So things that kind of make it simple, reasonably priced, um, and and kind of goes beyond just... Uh, so, so kind of, I, I guess, a question for you would actually be what other lived spaces um, has formaldehyde been, been detected? I mean, do you, do you think it would be... I don't know, what communities are we reaching out to with this kind of kit? Uh, I mean, I wish it was a really concisely and uh, geo-specifically bound community, but it's kind of everyone. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, there, are certain, there are certain communities that have worse, so Mobile homes, manufactured homes, 20 million people live in those, and they have four times the ambient formaldehyde levels of conventional homes. Um, new homes, probably the low hang, most low-hanging fruit would be green homes, because those are people that are in the environmental dialogue mm -hmm. uh, that have extremely sealed, uh, uh, energy-efficient ho housing, which maintains a lot of um, uh, a lot of chemicals. So, like, uh, there's a billionaire's daughter contacted me about her green mansion. Um, being having really high formaldehyde levels, so um, the the environmental justice, you know, the, the the circuits of chemical production that expose some in the name of sheltering others have their leakages, and so sometimes the 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 more affluent people uh, also get exposed. Um, it could be marketed to real estate agents for new housing, um, people who are doing renovations, uh, hardwood floor installations. So the, I mean, we are. Gretchen and I were blown away with actually how high the levels were when we were in Rhode Island a month ago doing um, measuring lumber liquidators installs, homes with lumber liquidators flooring. It's, and then some of them were five years old, still pretty high levels. Um, and uh, so, for those of you following along, there is a lawsuit going on now between global community monitors and lumber liquidators. Just Google that and you'll find plenty of information. Yeah. Um, so I think, I mean, those are some of the communities. Also, I mean, a lot of office spaces. Um, um, Michelle Murphy has, an, has a beautiful book on, um, on stick building syndrome. Um, I just saw her two days ago. Um, but, it, I mean, so it's been a problem since the 90s in terms of uh, the indoor air quality issues in, in workspaces. I think workspaces are primarily who, the, who buy the $230 space. Workspaces mm -hmm. are regulated, mm -hmm. so um, home spaces are not. Um, so I think that's also part of it. There's someone who's responsible for someone else's breathing space at, right. in, the, in the office, or that's not true in the home. Um, even though we spend most of our time in the home, and even though the most vulnerable bodies spend more time at home, mm -hmm. children and also the elderly. So I mean, yeah, it always struck me, Nick, how you would say that the, you know, domestic, you know, indoor airspace is the at least in the United States, is the largest unregulated airspace. Um, yeah. But I also want to point out that, you know, people who are interested in this kit, you know, may also be interested from the idea of like, oh, wow, well, let's, let's test 
this early research that NASA did on plants scrubbing the air. Um, let's, you know, make a kit of our own. It doesn't take any electronic components. Um, it involves like weird living things like plants or maybe bacteria and then um, you know we can mail around these formaldehyde test kits to see you know before and after if your equipment is working so it's a real citizen science opportunity that I think um, has a really broad appeal um, beyond even impacted populations of which you know potentially great Yeah, and, and other, one other thing, and I think maybe Matthew knows more about this than I do, is that there have been studies also that find that uh, the installation of certain kinds of plants, usually outside of the home, can qu quantifiably reduce the amount of particulate matter that enters the house. So the leaf magnetism, so this is a totally different mechanism than the filtration, but um, the leaf magnetism itself can attract particulate matter and, and decrease um, uh, the, the 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 poor air quality that's seeping into the home, as opposed to the air quality, the VOCs that are just building up in the home from the building materials and the various commodities that we fill our, our li living space with. Um, so I think that might be another angle. I mean, everyone sort of air quality is a, is a popular problem. I mean, it's a problem mm -hmm. that's not just confined to these places. Indoor air quality is. Oh, almost always high is almost always worse than corresponding outdoor air quality. So I think that people think that it's just you know you close your door and then you're you're good, um, but things are seeping in at the same time as building up. So um, I think we can do a sort of a, gra a, a, a greedy grab towards a larger community um, as opposed to just the, the specific ones that may be our base. Great. Um. <clears throat> this is a great intro, everybody. Um, what I what I'm hoping we can get into now is a is a bit of a work session um, because you know there there's a group of us here in New York at least who are committed to meeting in person and like getting some of these like you know possibilities for what kind of fans or what kind of blowers, what kind of pot. Um, you know, we, we want to actually start getting equipment together and, and prototyping stuff with, with an eye toward, like, if we can get something that works in a kind of, like, simple manner, we could actually make, we could do, you know, some bulk purchases, and then the Public Lab Kits team, um, hi, Matthew, thanks for being here, um, um, is willing to kind of, like, stock these kits in the store to get maybe, you know, an additional 20 or 30 people up and running with their own plant filters. Um, so I'm really interested in, in hearing from some people who have either like run workshops already, like Nick, or maybe built their own, like Matt or Jeff, I'm not sure. Um, what, you know, what equipment are you guys thinking about? Um, how could, what's a good starting point for people who are looking to actually, you know, build one of these things? Is it just me that's actually built one? No, I think I think Matt has one. I'm not sure. It might just be you. Oh no, Matt's saying. No, I haven't. I've built. I've only built the testing kits. I haven't built a remediation kit yet. Okay. Um, all right. So let's hop over to the remediation wiki. Um, It's going to take me forever to figure out how to share my screen. Um, it might so be on the I, left. If you yeah. hover over the video on the left, there's a green button. Yeah, I'm clicking. I just ha I'm just i really stubborn about buying electronics. So unless it's really, 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 really dead, I just let it live. Um, yeah, my phone that I had dropped in a river, I was using for a while, even though it didn't have a microphone. Um, it was like a one-way walkie-talkie. Um, <laughs> maybe the screen share button decided not to work for me anymore. Anyway, you can <laughs> you can check it out on the Public Lab website. Um, you can uh, go to the wiki. It's a DIY indoor air quality remediation kit wiki. And this was actually made by about 12 different students that I did a, um, a workshop with at Appalachian State University um, in North Carolina with uh, about a year ago. So that was, the, that was the first one, and they were all 
on there together making this um, making this wiki. Uh, you can see at the very top of the wiki there's a um, sort of a diagram of how it would work. And there's some very basic things that you need. You need a, a pot of some sort. Um, you need a growth medium. We're, so we're, we're largely working with, um, sorry, I want to come back and look at everyone. Uh, no problem. Oh. And I'm, I'm, sc I'm sharing my screen now. Oh, okay, great. Um, I was like, how did that start working? Um, so there's some very basic things that you need. Um, a plant, oh, I was talking about the growth medium, right. Um, so the growth medium, we're working with a hydroculture growth medium right now um, because, for, for a couple reasons. One, it is in, increases the amount of airflow you can pull because uh, there's space between these rocks, which are uh, recycled glass that are sort of blown up. Um, and also it's going to reduce the likelihood of having fungus and bacteria that we don't necessarily want um, growing uh, and then being rebroadcast around the room. Um, and it's also, once you get it going, it's a lot easier to maintain. You just pour water in. Hopefully there'll be sort of a, a semi-transparent um, receptacle so you can see the water line. You can just draw a water line. Just know that you always have to fill it up to that water line. So even people with black thumbs can uh, grow what they need to grow. Um, and so basically you just need to get some air. You need to get a cable um, into the pot. You reverse the diaphragm on the, uh, on the pump and you start pulling air through, through the roots. So you need a receptacle, you need a, an aquarium pump that you reverse the diaphragm, turn into a vacuum, some tubing, um, some meat growth medium, and also, um, yeah, a plant. So the, the, the different kinds of plants we have up on our website, um, there's a variety of, um, of, yeah, oh, this is there. Uh, so there's a variety of different kinds, so the, the ones, here uh, that are just listed are for formaldehyde. The one that ones that are listed and also have a star a star next to them are also work metabolized toluene and xylene, and we'll work on getting a more robust list. There's a lot of literature, so it's just going to be taking me taking the time to put it up there in, a, in an understandable format. Um, I was talking about this kit over the weekend at a conference in Chicago, and uh, an eminent anthropologist said that all of the plants they were using were very ugly. Um, so I think that that's, we have a main, major, major design problem there. They're, uh, they're all too ugly. So <laughs> hopefully we'll find some pretty ones. Um, and I mean, that, those are sort of the, the basics. Um, if, you, if you remember in the images that I showed earlier, there was a variety of different materials that I used. I'll try and screen share again. We'll see if it's possible. Um, no. So uh, what I've been what I've been doing is uh, drilling into the base and then having a, a little gasket and then that's a water that's water tight and running the, the cable up into the into the like the knot of the roots. Um, but you really don't need to do that. It's more complicated and it adds uh, a lot of different adds risks, you know, sometimes it leaks when I was drilling through glass, drilling through glass is really delicate and sometimes leaked a little bit. It makes it a lot more aesthetically pleasing because you can hide the cable very easily, um, but you can really just go over the lip of the, the, the vessel and come up down uh, under the root system as well to pull the air through. So there's a variety of ways of doing it and, and the pump that we're using is six dollars. You can use a one dollar thing you can find from the one dollar pot you find in the thrift store, um, and you can use two a dollar to two dollars of growth medium, and a five dollar plant. So you're looking at less than twenty dollars for a complete kit, um, whereas the kit without even a plant costs two hundred and thirty dollars. So I mean that's a that's this a, is great. That's a big thing. Yeah. I mean I love the price point on this project. I love that it doesn't require any soldering. Um, I love that it does involve plants or else a bacterial broth, I think. Um, so um, uh, can I ask um, Matt, um, Kit's team, Proxy, um, about what was this squirrel cage blower thing and what were you complaining about with the aquarium pump? Oh, well, the aquarium pump Nick has is, is quieter than the ones we're using for... Um 
testing, but the ones we use for testing are pretty loud. And so that was one thing we, we, we had brainstormed was potentially other um, pumps that could have enough pressure to blow air through the root zone of a plant, but wouldn't necessarily cause too much uh, noise and would also be easy to play around with. And uh, a specific type of blower, uh, the official name is a squirrel cage blower because it looks like a cage that a like hamster would run in, essentially. And um, those, uh, those types of blowers are a higher pressure blower than a fan. And um, they're, they're available as computer parts, so as, as, as old computer parts that are 12 volts. And now there are some parts that are 5 volts that you can find online. And what's nice about that is that they'll work with <clears throat> a variety of commercially available power supplies and things. And if people are prototyping, it would be a pretty cheap. It was it was just one thing that would be probably a pretty cheap prototyping item, um, and something that could easily be uh, be plugged in and potentially run um, on DC power or um, and would run quietly. So it was just yeah. one component for prototyping we were thinking of that would be a, a quiet addition to a house. Okay, so DC power means um, batteries, right? Or your computer. So okay, there are a couple that are five volts. They could run off a USB power supply, just like a phone or anything else. So huh. it's kind of nice. Cool. Um, or a solar panel, if people have sun, which we don't in New York. Um, a question though: the the aquarium pumps um, seem designed to put the air out in a tube, and it seems like a tube is required to go into the plant. It is like easy to go into a plant pot. These. Computer fans are kind of fan-ish, and they don't have tubes on them. Do you have any comments about that? No, not really. They don't have tubes. <laughs> well, like, how can you direct the air into the pot? If it's uh, the, a fan? The, the, um, the blowers will have a, a larger diameter tube, but they also blow out a tube, or, a, or often a slot. Either a slot or a tube. That's, it's not. It's not a tubing like a thin tubing. That's that's easier to run into the bottom of the pot, but it could still be drilled in, especially to a plastic one, like a one-inch pipe or something. Okay. And and that's sort of the model that the the plant air purifier, the more expensive version, runs on. So it has a squirrel. Is it a squirrel cage? Is that right? Hamster yeah. wheel fan. Um, so it has it in the bottom, and I think that it requires, and and getting the seal right on that is is part of the, the more expensive aspect of it. So you can take it out, take the plant out while also having the the cage in the bottom of the plant. It's a single unit, um, but it's also kind of hideous. Um, so, I mean, there's so if you if you just go and look through, if you do a patent search on air plant air purifiers, you can see a lot of the the sketches. And they're all in the public domain now because they were um, all there's a, sort of a rush for them in the the Poly Shore Biodome moment, um, and there's they've since become public domain. I don't I didn't know if if Shreya, if you had more you you just asked one question then we sort of got sidetracked I didn't know if you had more. Um, um, well, my confession is that I actually didn't know any of this background. I was just brainstorming with Liz one day, and it just got into a whole conversation about you know. How do people buy what plants? What would they be looking for to have in their home? That kind of stuff. So, yeah, you've been doing a great job of kind of clearing up the entire project, it seems. I think I have some work to do on the wikis. <laughs> I could just put this out there. Yeah. Well, and, and I can help you with that. Um, uh, could you have any more explanation on the, um, <clears throat> the contaminated chain letter bio broth? Thing like, what kind of basic parts would we be wanting to get? Would we be wanting to source if we wanted to get into that? If you're weird, like Bronwyn, or like, where would we get that bacteria? Um, so we know we know what strains of bacteria um, are have a certain predilection for chewing up formaldehyde. Um, there's these scientists in Iran that went to formaldehyde plants and went to the 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 polluting tube at the end of the by the plant in Iran and cultured all the bacteria there. Um, 
So you go to the source of pollution to find what life thrives um, in the face of the toxicity. Uh, and I think, off the top of my head, I think they're a, a strain of Pseudomonas, um, a benign uh, a benign kind. That's, I think Pseudomonas is used in a lot of bioremediation projects, um, so it's not a total surprise. Um, Pseudomonas, uh, there is a version of it that's harmful to humans, like the, the green snotty streamers that kids have a lot in playgrounds, that's Pseudomonas, so it's, but it's a, it's a, it's a strain that's it's benign that's doing a lot of the formaldehyde remediation, so that's one option. Yeah. Sorry, Nick, do you mean, did you mean actual snot? Yeah, yes, so <laughs> I did. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Pseudomonas. There's a kind of pseudomonas. I, I know. I know the bacteria from my infectious disease classes uh, in undergrad. Um, as it's something that a, a certain kind of it is an opportunistic infection of people that are have a compromised immune systems for young people. Um, so this is not what would be spreading. I can see like the liability. Giving. Are you okay, Liz? No, <laughs> no. Let's just scrap this. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. I just, I'm just I'm very, you know, effusive. Please person. go ahead. <laughs> um, uh, so that, yeah, there, but there's a, a lot of. I mean, these are these are the bacteria that we're living with. I think there's a, you know, there's a. We're living with an increase in, within like an increasingly post-pasteurian moment where we're realizing that bacteria are, are necessary for a lot of life processes. So there's there's some spectacular fear of them because. They can cause some can cause human harm, but then a lot are who we are and what makes us human is through through these bacteria. So I'm just gonna plow on. We'll keep it hypothetical. We'll pretend Pseudomonas never left my mouth. Um, and what would <laughs> what would be needed is um, some bacteria, some nutritional broth of some sort. And these are these are basic lab supplies. I think uh, Gretchen might know a lot more about. And we yeah we need some sort of nutrient drip to feed them. So there's actually been studies um, that show what is the optimal feeding rate for keeping just a little bit of uh, air remediating bacteria alive. So there's a lot of work that's been done already, but um, it hasn't really been operationalized on like an individual biohacker scale. Um, and it's not illegal to, to mail that bacteria around. And I think Gretchen reached out to a colleague at the University of Michigan, one of the Michigan state schools, um, that was actually interested in pursuing this. And I think we're, we've been busy, so I haven't necessarily followed up. But it could be something that starts with a university lab work, buying the bacteria, and we cultivate off of that and sort of uh, spawn out of, <laughs> out of that uh, institutional environment, controlled institutional environment. Um, but maybe. Gretchen, you have some sort of uh, swoop and save on this kind of bacteria and their human health effects? <laughs> uh, no idea about a swoop and save, but, um, but yeah, um, they are, like, super common in most, like, you know, any, any sort of microbial um, uh, lab. And so I talked to a guy who... Um, we work together at Duke, and now he's a professor at um, one of the satellite Wisconsin schools. I um, can't remember which one. Maybe uh, Green Bay. I think, yeah, yeah, Wisconsin Green Bay. Um, but, and it's, yeah, it's pretty easy. It's also easy to make your own. Um, it's not easy to make your own in a sterile environment so that you would grow your own bacteria without it being contaminated with the more prolific bacteria that we would have in, in normal everyday life. Um, but the kinds of things that, like, for the nutritional broth, it's like, it's like salts, um, you know, potassium and you know, potassium chloride and some sodium sulfate and um, and some like, you know, just various carbon sources. So it's um it's it's actually pretty easy to make that stuff. But it's also really cheap, um, at least cheap in the scope of research. Um, I actually don't know how cheap it is um, in the scope of like day to day life. But um, uh, could you yeah, help us sounds... source? Uh, could you help us get a source for this stuff just to get started, and then, uh, um, yeah. Oh, uh, 
also Bronwyn's chipping in like, yeah, we have New York City is lucky enough to have a, a community class one biolab, hmm. you know, that called Genspace, who are our good friends, so maybe we can connect with them. But yeah, I mean, we're just, but Gretchen, like, just like a simple, straightforward source would be that we could buy and then figure out making later, just because we're trying to get, we're literally trying to make, like, our first prototype of the bacterial broth and then, like, our first prototype of the, you know, plant one. Yeah. Um, again, I don't... To start, like, the bacterial broth, you need to cultivate those bacteria, and buying pure strains of bacteria is not cheap. I meant the Can broth I... to keep them going. Can I jump in for a sec? Yeah. yeah. I've been looking... I was looking in the background while you were talking about this, and... Um, I was familiar with Pseudonomus bacteria in um, aerobic decomposition and was thinking where it would appear in a commercial aerobic decomposition process. And it seems like a lot of people who run wastewater treatment plants will make Pseudonomus strains to put into the waste-activated sludge process, which is basically what you're talking about with bubbling air through a, um, a giant sludgy pile of bacteria. Only in this case, you're interested in remediating the air as opposed to the water, which is what they're doing in a wastewater treatment plant. But waste-activated sludge is a weird and inaccurate term that is historical for what's essentially throwing, like, a sourdough starter into a pile of, sewer, in, of sewage and bubbling it and then pulling out another starter and doing it again. But they, th these would be people who'd have a lot of... Uh, there's some process papers on creating strains of pseudonomus to introduce to waste-activated sludge, and given that they're talking about introducing in a fairly uncontrolled environment a continuously flowing source of sewage, like the same type of thing, I bet their lab experiments are pretty close to what you'd be looking at for doing a, a home cultivation. Or um, So that would be waste, WAS, waste-activated sludge, would be a search term to look for here. Um, thank you, Matthew, for introducing the term uncontrolled stream of sewage into the public lab supply chain. Awesome. Uh, but I could see Bronwyn super grinning about this. So um, The other thing is where a lot of, at least in, um, like, a lot of research, people will start with, as Matt said, like, go to a wastewater treatment plant, get activated sludge, um, and that's the starting point for... A, like cultivating a lot of different um, bacteria, like any sort of decomposition. I was I was looking at flame retardant decomposition by bacteria, and we went to the sewer to the and got anaerobic um, like anaerobic digester sludge, um, which is like super gross. But uh, but that's where you start with a lot of these. So I guess that is so so if you can cultivate the bacteria that you want, it's easy to get that kind of. Um, it's free to go to a wastewater treatment plant and get that because they just want to get rid of that um, literal like shit. <laughs> um, but uh, but if you want to start with a pure strand, that's expensive. But. Um, okay, great. Uh, so, all right, this this is a lot of super helpful information. We're gonna be circulating the links and ideas and what what at least seems to be the first material list on the air quality group um, and also in, in pro as we get going on updating all the wiki pages. Um, this was um, super helpful information. I just, as we're reaching the top of the hour, um, I wanted to bring in two general questions about formaldehyde from the chat room, and I'll just say both of them, and then um, I'm not sure, maybe um, any, they're up for grabs, who wants to answer them, but the first is um, how, how would someone go about finding formaldehyde-free wood products um, to use in their home? And then the other are um, the other question is, should people be concerned with the levels of formaldehyde in everyday products like cleaning supplies and cosmetics? Um, is that enough to cause damage over time? And then um, what if you're working in a maker space and you're using a lot of glue? You know, are th is that enough to cause damage over time?
I think Matthew might be able to speak to the last one first. He's been doing testing with the kit and... Mm, no, maybe not biting. I'll go. I'll just I'll um, climb on. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'd like to hear you... you have... Oh, okay. Um, so I guess the first question was alternatives. Where do we find formaldehyde free building products? Um, I have been told, although I haven't bought them myself, that you can actually find uh, soy-based adhesive particle board in Home Depot and, and large box stores that sell um, that sell those sort of building materials at a comparable price, maybe a little bit more expensive. Um, but I also want to remind everyone that uh, increasing the amount so from having a soy-based adhesive holding together your home just means that there's more monocrop soy production in South America spraying lots of glycophosphate everywhere. So you're, you're displacing the toxicity elsewhere. So don't feel totally good about, um, about the alternatives that we have right now. Um, sorry. I, I'm not good at making people feel good. I, no, no, no. Can you just repeat that? I'm not sure if I understand what you just said. So one of the main alternatives to formaldehyde adhered particle board is soy adhered particle board and plywood. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And so to, to grow that soy, to vastly increase the amount of soy um, necessary. So I'm like, I'm reading these transcripts of, of, of the arguments between the formaldehyde industry and regulations and then the soy industry in terms of how to, how to move forward. And the soy industry is like, don't worry, we'll just cut down the rainforest. We got this, no big deal. Um, so uh, in order to, to, the success for industry is probably going to be an agriculturally grown industry um, and monocrop soy, largely coming from South America, has its own environmental consequences. So historically, okay. historically, those glues were made out of uh, animal products, protein from animal products. Um, so traditional, traditional carpentry glues are like um, made from, yeah, like like uh, waste cutoffs from um, from uh, uh, slaughterhouses, um, and some animals are preferable. Rabbit hide glue is one of the traditional like things that you'd make if you're doing carpentry, because rabbits make nice glue. Um, but plywood. My impression was that historically plywood was made mostly from old like cow's blood and pig blood um, glues, and that may. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if you see more of that again soon. There was some scare around that during the um, the mad cow scare in the 90s that like because glues were made out of bloods that potentially there was some brain in the plywood and that someone could get sick inhaling plywood. I don't think anything actually came of that and no one demonstrated that that could be a disease vector. But I, 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 I haven't I haven't found anything to indicate this, but it seems like that that may have increased the use of synthetics. Wow. Um, I guess we only have one minute, so I want to like just stop and let that soak in for a second, but I'm going to keep going on the, the cosmetics. So that's a big, I would go to the Environmental Working Group website to learn more about cosmetics and those kinds of exposures. If it's a low level for a long time, it could there could be an issue. The, the, mo the one that I think people are most concerned about is um, like Brazilian blowout, sort of like these hair straightening techniques. Um, a lot of the exposures are particularly worse to the people working in the in the facilities, the hair shops or the nail shops that are, are applying a lot of these um, these chemicals. Um, I know the place where I get my hair cut. Um, the woman lost her voice for six months after using Brazilian blowout. So it's not just a um, a couple people. It's <laughs> it's always a big industry problem. Um, I don't know much about cosmetics. Um, there is a little bit of chemophobia uh, about formaldehyde in general, so Johnson & Johnson changed their baby shampoo to not include uh, formaldehyde, because formaldehyde was an occult, meaning it wasn't an added ingredient, but it, it was off gas from some of the other ingredients at really minute levels that probably would not harm your body. Formaldehyde is actually produced within your own body all the time. Um, so it's about the level of exposure. Um, it's about the route of exposure coming through your skin versus ingesting. People are ingesting, especially in like countries like Indonesia, a lot of formaldehyde um, that's used to make fish look better than uh, than they really they really are to make them look to survive longer. Um, so that's a, that's a, a big problem in terms of ingesting. Wow. Um, and 
Yeah, I mean, I feel like any more, if I talk any more about cosmetics, I start to get ideological, so I'm just going to cut myself off there. But maybe hackerspaces, I mean, that hackerspaces was the last question, and Matthew's worked in those, and he's also used our test kit in hackerspaces and found levels that he was sort of surprised about, potentially. Yeah, I was using it in, uh, there are two hackerspaces here in Portland that have laser cutters, and okay. laser cutters I was particularly worried about because of plywood and, and other laminates, and uh, I found that where the laser cutter was internally vented, even though it was running through a, like a multi-stage carbon filter, okay. the carbon oh, filter uh, didn't actually get rid of all okay. the formaldehyde. Um, and so we had, we, had, we had levels that were between 35 and 60 parts per million, uh, per billion, sorry, as, uh, in, 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 the, in that space, in the space where the, the laser cutter was vented out, outdoors, um, which, you know, is going to get to somebody, but uh, the interior space was only at about 30 parts per billion, which is much, much better. So... Um, yeah, be, beware of the, the venting of any cutting, especially any cutting tools that you have uh, and are using. And that's a huge issue for particulate matter, too, which is another thing to get into there. Great. Um, any, any last questions as we get ready to wrap up this conversation that could obviously keep going and will keep going on our mailing lists and um, in the working group um, on this? But any last questions here? Is, is there a tradition of using Google effects at the end of every open hour? Should be. Yeah. All right, Nick. Hey. He's going to put a hat on someone. No one's stopping you. <laughs> Her mustache. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, great. Um, well, thanks, everybody. Um, I really... Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Up until now, I have really been enjoying this. All right. <laughs> I think traditions are important. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, all right. Well, look for updates on this on the mailing list. Um, there's there's been some just emails between um, the you know just a few of us that were working on actually getting like what would be a a V1 um, kit going, but uh, we should move those questions onto the list. Obviously, I should tell myself that, so we're doing it now, and look forward to meeting more people who want to get involved that way. Um, thank you very much, everybody. See you next time. Awesome. Cool, thank you.